Good news number four. Tonight's event, part of Thames Festival Trust Project London Lost Villages, which runs with support from National Lottery Heritage and Trinity Boy Wharf. Uh, tonight, we're going to be taking an in depth look at the work of Trinity House, the history of Trinity House Corporation, and the experiments of Michael Faraday at Trinity Boy Wharf as scientific advisor to Trinity House, as well as exploring the history of lighthouse illumination technology. Uh, remember that if you're watching this live, I would love if you uh, left a comment to say, to ask any question to either Julia or Frank, which I will introduce in a second, or just to let us know from where are you watching, uh, why are you interested in the subject, just to say hi and good evening and to let us know that you are with us. And if you can't stay for the whole of the event or you know somebody who might be interested in watching this conversation, just remember that the whole event, the whole video is going to stay on the Thames Festival uh, Facebook and YouTube. So it's not, we're not going to disappear. You can still catch up later. Now, Time to introduce our guests. Uh, we are tonight with, I'm going to begin with uh, Julia. Uh, Julia Elton is an engineering historian and the past president of the New Common Society for the History of Engineering and Technology. She gave her presidential address on the Fresnel lens and how the technology caught up with the concept and is currently working on a PhD under Frank James on lighthouse illumi illumination. Uh, thank you very much, Julia, for being with us this evening. Pleasure. And we're also joined by Frank James, who is a professor of history of science at the University College London, is also a past president of the New Common Society. Uh, Frank has edited six volume correspondence of Michael Faraday, um, including, uh, sorry, six volume correspondence of Michael Faraday, including all the letters he exchanged with Trinity House and the, Bo the Board of Trade and the Stevenson family. I think uh, Julia and Frank will tell us a bit later, uh, to tell us later a bit more about the Stevenson family and why they are important in our history today and also about lighthouse matters from 1836 until just before Michael Faraday's death in 1867. Many of Faraday's lighthouse trials took place at Trinity Boy Wharf, hence the connection with the wider project that we are covering at the Thames Festival. And James is also now working on a biographical study of Humphrey Davy and his circle. I might ask him also about that uh, before we conclude tonight's event. Frank, thank you very much for being with us this evening as well. Thank you. Uh, Frank, Julia, I know that we discussed some questions for tonight, but I think since both of you are past presidents of the New Common Society. I think actually my first question is going to be, what is the New Common Society? Julia, I think that's one for you. <laughs> well, it was founded in 1920, and it is the oldest learned society in the world for the history of engineering. And it's been publishing for a hundred years, volumes of transactions, and basically the papers that we've published over the last hundred years form the entire foundation of the history of engineering studies worldwide. Would you say that was fair, Frank? Yes, that's, that's absolutely fair. But uh, we, we've got about 700 members um, in this country and overseas. Uh, we run, well, obviously during the pandemic, we didn't run meetings, but we're beginning to get to run mm -hmm. meetings again, mostly hybrid. Uh, meetings we we found that hybrid meetings are quite a good way of getting a lot more people to come to meetings and the in-person element beginning to go up but I mean it's been fairly gradual I mean I I, I was a bit surprised I thought when people when pandemic ended we've just sort of be able to go to meetings but that's because I like meetings and <laughs> my colleagues are a bit wary still of the of the pandemic 
I think, it, I think I th could I also say actually that although we're called after Thomas Newcomen, who designed the first functioning practical working steam engine in 1712, actually we cover every aspect of the history of engineering, civil, structural, canals, steam engines, of course, right across the board, so that it's a very broad brush society. So chem yeah. chemical engineering, computer engineering, um, uh, anything with the word engineering in it, basically. Yes. <laughs> Um, how do you make uh, yeah, another question that just occurred to me? Um, how do you make technology and engineering more exciting for people like me who doesn't come from a science, uh, science or technology background, but is part of our history? So now I want to know more. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, there's a major problem with the perception of the social and cultural position um, of engineers, um, they're, they're pretty well paid. I mean, I don't take any nonsense of engineers who say say they're poor, they're not poor, uh, but they, they, there has been for a long time um, a sort of issue of social status that somehow sort of pure science is seen um, as having a higher social status. Um, I'm just reading a book uh, by Peter Collins on history of Royal Academy of Engineering, and that makes the that makes the case extremely clear mm -hmm. uh, that during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, there was a concerted effort uh, to improve the social standing of engineering. But part of the problem of that is the engineers' own fault, in that they have three big institutions: the electricals, the mechanicals, and the and the uh, civils, uh, and then about 80 or 90 other chartered institutions and that means the government's got a really tough job um, to uh, know who to talk to who to seek advice from and that's that's a big that's a big problem that has still yet to be resolved and one has to say that despite all the hopes uh, expressed in the 70s when the world academy of engineering was founded uh, it hasn't really sort of got to that same sort of status that the Royal society of london enjoys Okay, well, let's see if tonight we can make people enjoy our conversation about lighthouse technology and electrification and Michael Faraday and all the interesting uh, uh, stories. See, I, think, I, think, I think one of the things the Newcomer Society does and does well is to show how um, engineering is such an integral part of everybody's lives and I, I think that's the way one we need to go. It's not so much a sort of institutional arrangement, that's obviously important. It's just getting that sort of cultural idea of the importance of engineering. Because I mean, mm -hmm. you just think, what is engineered? Cars, roads, railways, nuclear power stations. I mean, they, they all require a high degree um, of engineering skill to build them. Because if they don't work, they fall down. As, mm -hmm. as we have seen in Turkey, where it's quite clear that the the building licenses for those uh, blocks of flats that have uh, fell, fell, uh, sort of collapsed um, was simply inadequate. And so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of life and death. And it's also a matter of life and death. If you think of the, of the lives we live, we mm. are all alive because actually there is wonderful, wonderful drainage, sewage systems water supply systems and yes there's a lot of trouble in the press at the moment of sewage you know being poured into rivers but you know we're all alive we're not dying of cholera it's a problem of course it is but actually civil engineering keeps us healthy alive and on the move mm -hmm. and, and 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 this also going back to the fact that um it's time for people to not be as scared of enjoying those stories. Like mm -hmm. uh, you may not be, you may not have a degree in arts, but a lot of people who like history like uh, to hear and read more about history of like art history. So why not history of the infrastructure infrastructure uh, around us? And talking about that, uh, I think it's time to go through the different stories you are going to uh, talk. Uh, to us tonight, this evening. And let's begin with, well, let's travel back some centuries. Um, and my first question on this journey we're going to uh, do together is, how has the British Lighthouse Service been organised going back, not even decades, but centuries? Yeah, so um, the 
Trinity House, which is the oldest of the Laut House authorities on these islands, was chartered by Henry VIII uh, in 1514. And it wasn't originally a lighthouse service. It was chartered to sort of uh, provide uh, homes, arms for retired, retired sailors. Uh, and in fact, that is still one of the major functions of today's modern, uh, modern Trinity House. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 1566 uh, that Trinity House was given the authority to actually start building lighthouses. Uh, but it's really not until the sort of eight, late 18th, early 19th century that that took off in any significant sense. Most lighthouses up until then were owned by private individuals. And if we can have my first slide in Chris Whitty, uh, so that's a sort of private, um, private lighthouse. And the owners, the private owners, made huge amounts of money uh, from the dues collected from ships uh, that sailed, sailed by those lighthouses. Now, Trinity House only worked, only sort of covered England and Wales. Um, and in 1786, the Northern Lighthouse Board covering Scotland uh, was, was formed, uh, followed a few years later by the Irish Ballast Board uh, in 1810. No, it's sort of slightly complicated, sort of various precursors to the Irish Ballast Board, but I won't yeah. bore you with that. Now, the great Whig reform government of the 1830s, uh, following the Great Reform Act of 1832, um, went through English institutions, just reforming them to bring them up uh, to modern uh, standards of the 1830s. And one of the institutions that they particularly were interested in was Trinity House. Um, and they decided that Trinity House should be the only lighthouse authority for England and Wales. And to that end, the government gave a million pounds uh, to Trinity House to go up, go around buying up all the private lighthouses. That's an enormous sum of money. I mean, time. Yeah. even multiplying it by 100 doesn't really give the sort of real impact um, of that uh, of that sum. Uh, but it's from that point that Trinity House uh, starts getting all the lighthouses around the English Welsh coasts under its authority. And that gives you a sort of um, uh, economy of scale, which, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and then, Franz, I got this photo uh, because I was trying to understand um, more about Trinity House because we, I knew you were going to be talking about it, and I was trying to locate where it was, or, or at least where it is, or where it was originally. So I, I'm not saying this is correct. Uh, it's generally a question from me yeah, to you. Yeah. Uh, if we look at this map, is it where it is it where it was located, or where it is it still located? It was, it was originally located in Deptford, which was sometimes formerly known as uh, Trinity House of Deptford Strand. Uh, but at some point uh, in the 18th century, they built uh, their current headquarters behind the Tower of London, which you can see top left in Trinity Square. So actually, that was, I mean, they had an earlier building before that, bef between Deptford Strand and Tower. They had a, they had a place in Water Street, okay. and I think they grew out of it. Okay. So, um, I mean, I, th I, think, I think if one spins back um, to to the 17th century what's interesting is that although they, they were given juris they were given jurisdiction they're allowed to build lighthouses they actually they may have put a few boats with a candle or two they actually didn't build their first lighthouse till 1609 which was lower stoffed coming down the east coast because of the newcastle coal trade bringing fuel to london and then they didn't build any more lighthouses until 18, 17, 16, 78 and 1680. They built one in Winterton in Norfolk. And in 1680, they built one in the Scilly Islands on St. Agnes because they were then picking up the tin trade coming up um, the English Channel. So they weren't, as Frank was saying, they weren't really they weren't really a sort of lighthouse. I mean, they built lighthouses, but they were not seen like that. Hmm. And in fact, by 1818, 1718, I'm sorry to get my centuries muddled up. By <laughs> 1718, um, you know, they had another few, another few. But by 1818, there were actually only about 175 lighthouses worldwide, of which Trinity House had maybe a dozen. So it was really 
after 1834, when they really get into it in a very, very major way. Okay, and just, just to finish on the organisation Lighthouse mm -hmm. Service, in 1856, the Board of Trade um, was given responsibility for colonial uh, lighthouses, um, and we'll talk about colonial lighthouses in, in, a, in a little bit. So by the 1850s, you had four separate British authorities um, for lighthouses, and the Board of Trade being government department tried to take over uh, running all lighthouses, so in other words, merge the Trinity House, Irish Ballast Board, uh, and the Northern Lighthouse Board under the control of the Board of Trade. And that was an enormous uh, uh, World Commission on lighthouses uh, in, 18, in the early 1860s. Um, and the politics is really, really complicated. I mean, I, I've, I've done a bit looking at sort of Faraday's role in that politics, and it's really hard to disentangle uh, what was happening. But whatever, whatever happened, nothing changed. And to this day, um, that's the situation on these islands. We have the Irish Lighthouse Board, the Scottish Northern Lighthouse Board in Scotland, Trinity House for England and Wales. And of course, as we no longer have any colonies, um, the Board of Trade's responsibility for colonial lighthouses disappeared as the empire disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, Julia was already mentioning or answering out part of what is our next uh, question on this journey, uh, our next chapter, which is talking about where were the lighthouses being built? Shall I talk about the Northern yeah. Lighthouse Board at this point? Yeah. So 1786, the Northern Lighthouse Board was founded because, in fact, Scotland has a highly indented coastline of about 7,000 miles. It's huge. And in that 7,000 miles, there were about two lighthouses before 1786. And naturally, there were shipwrecks galore. So in 1786, an act was passed and the Northern Lighthouse Board, or the Commissioners of Northern Lights, was set up. And they decided to build four lighthouses. If you could, we could have the next slide, the Kinnaird head slide. That's it. They decided to build four lighthouses. One of them was on an existing building, which was an old castle. And then there were three more, one in Harris, one in the Orkneys, and one on the Mull of Kintyre. And almost from the outset, they had an in-house engineer, um, Thomas Smith, in fact, who did the lighting for them, was also the stepfather and the father-in-law of Robert Stevenson. And so they began a dynasty of lighthouse engineers. In essence, there is indeed, thank you, the, the headquarters of the Northern Lighthouse Board. Um, and Trinity House were not building all that much at the time. Anyway, that's, so those were the first four lighthouses and then Ireland had one which was the hook and by about 1810 it had 10-ish lighthouses and then the colonial lighthouse board was set up. Do you want to have your last the, the slide for this one Frank? Yeah. Which is Menorah Point. That's it. And in fact, that lighthouse um, was built in 1889 with an earlier system of lighting, but that's the most that was the most advanced form of lighting in 1909. And it was built by Chance Brothers, whom we will be coming back to. Okay. I mean the other the other thing to I mean that was the Northern Lighthouse Board. The other the other thing that's that happened was that if you sort of look at the density of lighthouses in England and Wales, they moved from the east coast to the west coast, reflecting the change of build the change of British trading patterns. So Julia, I think you can sort of Well, since you know 
when the northeast coal field began to come up in the medieval period because of course it was providing fuel for london and therefore the coastal trade down the east coast of britain became very important and it's no coincidence that trinity house's first lighthouse at lowestoft um, is on a very far eastern point of the coast and picked up the traffic coming down um i mean there were some quite serious accidents um if they were, you know, no, they were, I mean, there were a lot of shipwrecks really on and on and on. And um, as, as Bernard Shaw said, actually, a lighthouse is the most altruistic form of building because they set out to save lives. They also, of course, set out to save cargo, but basically they save lives. Um, but then there's a second one, as I said earlier, at, at Winterton S in Norfolk. And then, of course, you know, the Cornish trade picks up of, of tin. And so they then have an important lighthouse on St Agnes. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, you know, trade begins. They then begin to build you know, up the Bristol Channel. They slowly begin to get going. What we haven't mentioned is, of course, the most famous lighthouse in this country which is the edda stone but it was of course a private light and it had to be bought out though trinity house did eventually take it over and they took out its candles and replaced it in 1807 with the most up-to-date lighting so there were other lighthouses but they were privately owned um and as Frank said, they are the, I mean, they, they, the private lighthouses made millions for their owners. And in fact, Burnham, which we looked at earlier, was paid, the owner of the, that little funny little lighthouse in Burnham-on-Sea, <laughs> um, they were bought out in the 1834, um, in the 1834 act that gave Trinity House all this money. They paid the owner, Thirteen thousand pounds, six hundred and eighty. Thirteen thousand six hundred and eighty-one pounds in compensation. Yeah. And in a minute, we're going to have a slide of Dungeness, Dungeness Lighthouse. In fact, you could skip to Dungeness Lighthouse. You see a very dramatic view of the open fire. Yeah. It made between eighteen twenty-eight and eighteen thirty-one in shipping dues. It made over twenty-eight thousand pounds. So, you know, they were absolute gold mines, these places. But, but who, who is paying who when all these people are making money? So um, how does the flow of, of payments go? Oh, there are agents at the port. So you, so you sail past the lighthouse and the next port, there is an agent who relieves you of your money. OK. It's a very simplistic way of putting it. But the, and Trinity House had agents in every port because they also collected lighting dues. As you sailed into harbour, there would be your Trinity House agent saying, you have just passed XYZ Lighthouse. So it's like it's like when you go through the Dartford Tunnel and you have to pay a toll, You right? have to pay a toll, basically, yeah. yes. And that's how they made their money. So Trinity House made quite a lot of money, but nothing compared to the private owners. And, of course, if you were a private owner... You know, you weren't compelled to keep up the lighthouses. You weren't compelled to keep the light going every night. Spurn Point in, you know, downstream of Hull is a very good case in point. They had endless trouble with the owners of Spurn Point. Endless, endless. And partly because the light kept being washed away and the owners of the land didn't, you know, weren't terribly interested in rebuilding. So there is endless rows that go on for many, many, many years. But, you know, when they did build lighthouses, they then raked in the money. So, <laughs> you know, it was very, it was very lucrative if you were a private owner. And if you were, and if you were a private owner who didn't really care, it was lucrative and you didn't have to put any money into the lights. Yeah. I know we skipped, uh, we skipped one image uh, to go to Dungeness. Mm. But, um, I'm going to put it again in case. Back to Flamborough. Ah, yes, I wanted to say something about Flamborough here because this shows how, how lighthouses worked before the you get the sort of lighting systems that Julie is mm -hmm. going to talk about. At a, at a lot of sites, you had two lighthouses. You can see one on the left and one on the uh -huh. on the right. And the idea was that as you sailed by. The, the angular distance between the lights changed so you knew where you were. 
Um, and that's really rather important because it's all very well to sort of see a lighthouse. Uh, but if you don't know where, if you don't know which lighthouse you're looking at on a dark night, you've got a big problem uh, if you're looking at the wrong lighthouse and you suddenly sort of find yourself not where you want to be and on the on the rocks. Uh, mm. So that was the, that was the way they dealt with it until they sort of started developing uh, very advanced um, lighting and optical optical systems. Okay. And you see this, you see, yeah. flat row, you see it at, at South Foreland uh, and um, um, St. Catherine's on the Isle, Isle of Wight. Interesting. And so the, the, the reason I put that slide, I wanted to show that slide if we go back to it and you also get the three stages of, of light. So that little black number right at the back of the, of the you know, on the extreme right hand of the slide is, yes. just an, is just an open basket in which you lit a fire. And then the next one along is a much more, looks like a lighthouse, is a much more <laughs> formal tower, but it also had a fire on it. And in fact, it was only the one that's nearest to us, which is 1807. And it had absolutely the most up-to-date lighting of the time and was the first lighthouse, certainly in this country, to try to indicate which lighthouse you were absolutely you were looking at. You could get muddled up between the lighthouses and it used colored, it used colored filters to try and indicate to the sailors that if you saw a red light, that must be Flamber Head. Oh, wow. I must definitely visit uh, the Flamber Head. Can you, because I'm not very familiar with the area, can you tell me what is it in England? So it's, it's on the northeast coast. It's in Yorkshire. It's okay. wonderful. It's a wonderful coast. Okay. I'm very curious about visiting now. Yes. Uh, Julia, uh, Frank, uh, you started to touch a bit on this, on the next subject, which is the different sources of light. That's for you, Julia. Okay. <laughs> well, I've just talked about, you know, fires. And if you had them in an open basket, naturally, um, they were more difficult to keep under control. If you had them on a purpose-built tower, at least you had some lighthouse keeper up there poking the fire, if I can put it so. Um, but they made efforts to do something a bit more sophisticated so that if we have... Well, let's say Dungeness again, because it's a nice illustration of a major lighthouse with a fire in it. Um, but, of course... If there was a fog or if there was heavy rain or, you know, the fire died down, it was all quite iffy, except, of course, if that's all you had, you kind of got used to it. And, you know, with no light pollution, you'd have seen it further away than we might think nowadays. And so then if you go on to the next one, the next slide, no, no the Edderstone, the candles. That's it. So the Edderstone Lighthouse, so Smeaton, who is a great, great engineer with a very scientific bent, is actually looking um, at something slightly more reliable, possibly, than open fires. And so he puts in this 24-candle chandelier, and <laughs> they were very, very, very big candles. And he said that standing on a, with a telescope on Plymouth Hoe, looking nine miles out to sea to the Edderstone Lighthouse, he could see the candlelight. Though, as Frank pointed out the other day, it would have to be a nice clear night with no wind, you know, no waves. But even so, no light pollution, so that if, he, you know, if he said he could see it, yes, he could. Um, the previous lighthouse, you couldn't see it so from so far away, according to him. So that, in fact, was lit up for, um, I think, probably, anyway, a centenary of some kind. That's actually, it was lit up. That's the Edison Lighthouse now on Plymouth Ho. It's But it's quite nice to be able to see it lit. And if you go on to the next slide. Uh, is this, this which the, is that's it. That's yeah. it. That's Can it. I just say about this? I hmm. love this photo because Good. I'm looking at the Edison Lantern and to me, this looks more like a chandelier that I would expect to find in a palace that 
Ja, nee, nee, she's a chanter. Yeah, she, no, he called it a chanter. <laughs> he, he, he called it a chanter. I mean, and I'm sure that's where he got the idea from. It's just, I think the candles were much bigger than you would normally get in a, even in a palace. It's absolutely uh, stunning. And, and I think I think a point to remember is even, even though candles are sort of relatively weak sources of light, if you've got nothing else, they, they do show up as as, as um, Smeaton's telescopic observations showed. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now, let's talk. Uh, I think we're going to this next slide, the Scottish cruise lamp. Well, if you didn't have fire and you didn't have candles, another form of lighting was actually to use oil lamps. And that downward hanging hook is actually you turn it up up and you and you can hang it from a from a hook mm -hmm. and you would have a wick floating about in that little basin and your oil in this country certainly would have been very crude whale oil and very 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 smoky and smelly and disgusting mm -hmm. and it froze in the winter and it produced a lot of problems but they used this quite routinely in Scotland um, I was going to ask about the name. Is it because uh, they were used mostly in uh, Scottish lighthouses? Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, they're called cruisy lamps. So uh, they're just oil lamps. You see them sort of all over the place, but Scotland being a very important part of the lighthouse story, cruisy lamp is it for the point of view of this. Mm -hmm. And the great thing is, if you go to the next slide... The Argant lamp. lamp. And I'm afraid it's a, ter it's a terrible picture because I took it from <laughs> glass. In, I'm really in sorry. A... I, uh, yeah, it's a bit pixelated on, 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 on my screen as well. Well, yes. it's also be because I had to take it through glass in a museum, in a French museum. Um, the point about the Argant lamp is that it, in fact, had a tubular wick, which meant that you could have oxygen on both sides of the flame, which, you know, helped burn off the impurities. And then if you put a, ca um, a, la um, a chimney over it, as you see here, mm -hmm. that helps the draft. And effectively, this light was totally smokeless. And actually, it was probably, it, not even probably, it was the, the greatest advance in lighting technology for 2,000 years. And it completely transformed lighthouse lighting because if you um, combine it, as we will be coming on to in a minute, if you combine it with a big reflector, hmm. it means that you can, it means the reflector doesn't get sooted up. All, all reflecting lights before this period, there was very little point really um, in having reflectors because the lighthouse keeper would spend all night with a duster and always trying to keep the soot off the reflecting surface. So the Argand lamp, terrible picture, I'm sorry, is absolutely crucial to this story. And if you go back, if you go back one more time and have another look at that cruisy lamp, mm -hmm. just for contrast, you can see you go from that sort of lamp to the Argand lamp. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole... And, and Julia, I guess also it's not an improvement in terms of the equipment that the lamp itself is also an improvement in terms of their living conditions and the health of their lighthouse keepers, right? Oh, absolutely. And of course, although we're talking it in a light, talking about it in a in a lighthouse context, it completely transformed domestic lighting. So that in fact, when Argan finally came to England and took out a patent here, the person who marketed the Argan lamp was Matthew Bolton of Bolton and Watt. He was very shrewd. He could see that this lamp was an absolute breakthrough and, it, you know, it transformed domestic lighting. I mean, from our point of view, of course, I'm really only interested in the fact that it transformed <laughs> lighthouse lighting. <laughs> Do you want to talk about electricity at this point, Frank? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so one, as part of the reforms of the 1830s, one of the things Trinity House did was to appoint a scientific advisor uh, and they chose Michael Faraday. Um, he seems to be the only person uh, they, uh, they they wanted. Faraday working at the Royal Institution was very much seen as Humphrey Davies' successor in the application of uh, science for practical purposes. Now, most of Faraday's work was mundane, uh, sort of analyzing salt water, 
um, and water supplies at uh, various lighthouses. Um, it was looked analysing the uh, contents of red and white lead paint, which you need for the uh, outside of lighthouses. Um, but he did do a couple of things, um, particularly about the electrification um, of lighthouses. Now, when you think about it, if you're sitting around in 1850, thinking, where shall we use electric power for the first time? Lighthouses are not the most obvious uh, location. They're remote, weather's inclement, um, lighthouse keepers are well known to be drunk, mm -hmm. and as, as they're encouraged to be teetotalers. There's even a subgenre of mm -hmm. um, evangelical literature to try and keep them uh, on the straight and narrow with not too much obvious success, I have to say. The number of suicides I've noticed in lighthouse keepers in the 19th century is rather, rather high. Um, but Faraday had that sort of extraordinary influence uh, at Trinity House that persuaded them to sort of persuade them to say, well, let's give electri electrification a go. Uh, mm -hmm. And there were two schemes proposed, one by Dr. Watson and one by Mr. Holmes, which I'm afraid to say is not an original joke. It was <laughs> early 20th century. Um, Watson's idea was to use electric batteries. And Faraday, after extensive testing at, undertaken at Trinity Boy Wharf, uh, said that this simply wouldn't work. The idea of maintaining uh, batteries to um, uh, maintain a sort of carbon arc lamp up a, up a lighthouse, lighthouse was simply impractical. Uh, the other was by um, uh, Frederick Hale Holmes, whom we don't know anywhere enough about. And his idea was to take advantage of Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic induction, the principle behind an electric generator that he made in 1831, uh, and drive an electric generator using a steam engine to drive a carbon arc up a lighthouse. So basically you had, you had two carbon, you had carbon poles and a sort of spark between them. And the clever bit was you have to keep those, that distance absolutely the same, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, because as Faraday pointed out in a lecture, uh, any variation of, of a light at sea is far more dangerous than having uh, no light at all. And Faraday tested this extensively, again, at um, Trinity Boy Wharf. And the, one of the reasons why uh, there's that lighthouse there, though it's not sadly the one that Faraday used, was because he got a two-mile cast of light uh, down, the, um, uh, down the Thames uh, to test this. And eventually it worked, and Faraday had it installed at South Foreland Lighthouse, where it first worked uh, in 1859. And... Faraday was so committed to this work that one winter, uh, when it was about three feet of snow, uh, he walked from Dover to South Foreland, uh, climbing over hedges and walls uh, to test the light. You said he walked? He walked, yes. Because the, 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 his, his, his chase couldn't get through the, um, through the snow. Um, and he would go out to sea uh, to sort of see the effect of the light at sea. That got him a severe reprimand from his doctor, who banned him from going to sea again because Faraday clearly suffered from uh, seasickness. Um, <laughs> and that program was continued by Faraday's successor both at the Royal Institution and Trinity House, John Tyndall. But after a while, it was clear that this was simply not cost effective because one of the things was that if you're running a steam engine and an electric generator and a carbon arc, you needed an engineer on site. And that required a very skilled engineer who's being paid 120 pounds a year at South Foreland and you would need engineers at other locations like Dungeness and Suter Point which were also mm -hmm. electrified so after a while Trinity House abandoned the um, abandoned the program uh, and electric electrification did not come back onto the agenda until the 1920s by which time you had the national grid being developed and the incandescent light which made electrification a much, much more practical possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of those really interesting examples of a technology where somebody was just trying to push the limits too far. A, I mean, a bit too early. A bit too early. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think the only reason why Trinity House went down that really quite extraordinary path was because Faraday said it would work. <laughs> I mean, it did work, but I mean, it's the, it's the practicalities that were the mm -hmm. that were that were the problems.
So, so he was ahead of his time. I don't like the phrase ahead of his time. Um, <laughs> it, it, did, it did show, I mean, one thing it did show was that the that electric power certainly had potential and just how you actually mm -hmm. realized that potential, that was the, that was the issue. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly by the 1880s, 1890s, you began to get incandescent lights coming through, invented by Swan in this country and Edison in the United States. Um, again, but originally those were driven by uh, individual generators and municipal generators. Um, it's really the national grid uh, that was mm -hmm. absolutely key uh, to getting electrification uh, mm -hmm. running, and that doesn't happen until the until 1920s. And uh, it's, uh, in, in that particular case, it's a very good example of the state actually directing resources. I mean, after the end of the Great War, um, the state tried to set step back from controlling industry, uh, and in the main it did. But in terms of electrification, the, the state realised that they had to sort of control it. So they set up things like the Central Electricity Generating Board, which had responsibility for the um, national grid, and that's when lighthouses started to be uh, electrified. I mean, what was quite interesting is that finally, I mean, before the electrification program began, actually the lighthouses had a perfectly efficient system that worked perfectly well, in which you have your lighthouse keeper and you have a store of oil and you have an oil lamp which is sitting in your optic oil, etc. And so the lighthouse keeper just keeps the lamp filled up with oil, which was a whole lot simpler than fiddling about with the electricity. So it was a sort of practical point, particularly since, as Frank said, one of the problems with, the, with I think, with the homes generator, I've, and I suppose at South Foreland, is that, in fact, you know, A, they couldn't make the steam engine work, and B, I mean, it was a very difficult life as a lighthouse engineer, as a lighthouse um, keeper. And I think there was, I think one of the lighthouse keepers, you know, was drunk all the time and just couldn't keep the steam engine going. I mean, there were a lot of sort of, you know, the, the steam generator going. There were a lot of sort of practical problems. So, um, so we would we have talked about the sources of light, and I think we're gonna get slightly more techy now because we're now gonna talk about the optical systems used. Well, the thing is, we as you say, we've been talking about the light sources: fire, candles, oil, electricity. Well, fine. So you've got your light source, and it's how you get your light source out at sea far enough to be able to be seen. And I'm not going to go into the pre-reflector um, history, which actually is very interesting, mm -hmm. but before the Fresnel optic came in, actually they had developed a parabolic reflector. A parabolic reflector will produce a parallel beam. Other reflectors, spherical reflectors, the light goes all over the place, but a parabolic reflector will produce a parallel beam. And this is where, going back to the Argand lamp, which was crucial, you had a very good light source that did not smoke up all those beautiful silvered surfaces, but in fact, was reflected off the parabolic reflector and could be seen really quite a long way away. I mean, 10 miles, something like that. And although some work had been done in Britain on parabolic reflectors with funny little bits of mirrored glass, the real breakthrough came with the French. And I'm always quite interested because actually most British lighthouse history never talk about the French. The French were absolutely crucial. Argand was actually Swiss, but his lamp was first taken up in France. And this is the a part of the reflector that was put on Cordouan Lighthouse in 1790. And Cordouan Lighthouse was the first modern lighthouse, of, was the first lighthouse of modern times. And if you go on one slide for a minute, you'll see. Um, isn't there another one? Uh, or did you take it out? No. This one? No. Go, no. no, go back, go back. There was one that in fact showed up the old Cordouan lighthouse. Never mind, never mind. Um, it was the great Renaissance lighthouse and in, and very beautiful. And in, 17, in, in 1786, it was 
go on, now go to the next slide. It was heightened. So you can see the very beautiful bottom Renaissance bit and then the 1786 um, much heightened tower. And it was heightened in order to put that reflector system on, if you go back to the reflector system. So because the interesting they, thing they is... They it taller to fit mm -hmm. this piece of equipment. No, 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 no. They made it taller so it could be seen further out at sea. Uh -huh. And so what's interesting is that they take this very wonderful lighthouse and they use it as a kind of test bed for all their lighting systems. And so, in fact, um, the reflector system came in and it was incredibly effective and it was used all over the world and it was certainly used all over Britain because it worked very well and the maintenance was quite low and you could in fact either have it revolving as here or else you could have it stationary and it worked for you could have lots of tiers of lights you could have a single reflector you could have multiple reflectors very 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 good and efficient system and then you come to a second breakthrough, I suppose, which is the invention of the Fresnel refracting lens. And that comes in, it's very, you can, the, the time scale is absolutely precise because Fresnel comes into the Commission des Phares of France, wants to do this. He's a, I mean, Frank will be able to talk better than I can about his role in the development of the understanding of light. But he wants to build an, a refracting optic and it, com it completely changes the face. It's much more powerful. I mean, it produces 14,000 candles worth of light, even in the early days. It's extraordinary. I mean, a whole sort of different um, point of it. The whole, it's a whole different ball game. And the point about pushing a light through a lens is that in fact, you know, is that in fact it refracts, the light goes through at an angle and you in fact can calculate the shape of the lens in order to send the light anywhere you want. So it's kind of magic. I mean, that's what I find very magical about it. <laughs> it does, it does so, sound like so, magic, yes. No, it is. I mean, being, being able to take a 40-watt light bulb, stick it in the middle of this cage of glass, and then you can send it anywhere you like. Yeah, extraordinary. Is that, am I getting, <laughs> would you like to just talk a little bit about, Frank, about you're much better at this than me. Yeah, so... In, again, well, actually, the first job that Faraday did for Trinity House um, after his appointment as scientific advisor uh, was to examine uh, the Fresnel lenses that they decided to install uh, at Start Point, and this was sort of new technology um, uh, for for Trinity House, and uh, they were always very cautious because, as as it's quite clear, sort of. If you have a faulty lighthouse and it doesn't work, lives and cargoes are at serious risk. And so presumably these enormous boxes of lighthouse ribs, Fresnel ribs, uh, arrived. Um, you've got one in, you've got one in um, uh, uh, Trinity Boy Wharf. And they arrived at Trinity Boy Wharf and Faraday spent a long time writing some very long reports uh, on the uh, yes, I'm just showing some images of Trinity Boy Wolf for anybody watching tonight who's not very familiar with, with the place. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, the great thing, one of the great things about Fresnel lenses is because they're made of individual ribs, uh, you can have one that's so slightly damaged or chipped and it makes no impact at all on the overall light. Whereas if you've got a, if you've got a, if you've only got a single lens, and there's something wrong with it that can that can sort of reduce the amount of light available. So Fresnel lenses are not only produce parallel beams; they they are also much more effective at, at repairing them. So if something goes wrong, if one breaks, it's very easy to make it to sort of get a new one and uh, and put it in. 
And that, that's the sort of work that uh, Faraday did uh, in addition to his um, uh, more mundane, mundane work on water and paint analysis. And in total, uh, from his appointment in uh, 1836 until his death in 1867, 18%, 18%, I mean, in nearly, nearly a fifth of all of Faraday's letters deal with lighthouse matters. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that simply shows mm -hmm. how important uh, it was to him. I mean, Faraday didn't have to do that work. I mean, Faraday, had, there was no pressing monetary reason why Faraday should take on this sort of really rather onerous role. And, and in the past, he had turned down uh, roles uh, with other state agencies, which he sort of thought uh, was sort of uh, a bit waste of time. But I mean, for Faraday, it's, it's very much part of his religious duty uh, to help save human life. And he's very, very clear on that in a lecture he gives at the Royal Institution in 18. Uh, Frank, you made a very important point because I was going to ask you, if you could just very briefly tell us a bit about Michael Faraday, his like personal life, his background, because I think that has an effect on on his career and what he devotes himself to. Okay, so Faraday was the son of a dissenting blacksmith, a Sandemanian blacksmith. The Sandemanians were a very small sect of neo-Calvinists. Um, they died out in the 1980s in London, and the Scot I met the last old elder of the Scot of the Edinburgh Church uh, in the 1990s. Um, it's one of those sects that could flourish in the religiosity of Victorian Britain, uh, but in the post-Great War period, uh, it, it really sort of uh, suffered. Uh, Faraday was first apprenticed as a bookbinder, and he did seven years learning the trade of bookbinding. Uh, then at the age of 21, having done seven years, he decided he didn't want to be a bookbinder, uh, uh, but wanted to be a chemist, a natural philosopher, as it was then called. Uh, and he was very, very lucky, and he got a job working with Humphrey Davy at the Royal Institution, uh, first of all as laboratory assistant, and he worked his way up um, the Royal Institution's hierarchy to become... Uh, Superintendent of the House and his chief executive in modern terms in the 1820s. Mm -hmm. and Professor of Chemistry was created for him in 1833. Uh, and in the course of that, he made some of the most fundamental um, discoveries in 19th century physical science. So electromagnetic induction, that's the principle behind the generator and the transformer, the Faraday cage, which uh, isolates you electrically from the rest of the universe. Uh, the um, discovery of uh, that all matter had magnetic properties, that light could be affected by magnetism. And all that led, uh, by the 1850s, to the field theory of electromagnetism, which, in, which, in the hand, which Faraday formulated and which in the hands of Maxwell and Einstein and Peter Higgs uh, became and remains uh, one of the cornerstones of modern theoretical physics. And what's really what's interesting is that Faraday is taken as the supreme example of the uh, pure scientist, not even to use the word scientist, but that's what people <laughs> call him nowadays. Um, but he also did this enormous amount of applied work uh, in completely willingly. I mean, Trinity House paid him, uh, but as I said earlier, he just didn't, he didn't have to do it. And for him, it was, it was part and parcel uh, of his religious exercises and indeed his, his mission in life he sees it as part of his mission in life that's right yes and he's very clear on that can we if, if, you, if you could go back to the slide with the fresnel revolving lens uh this that is one mm -hmm. that is what faraday would have been testing that lens which is a revolving lens in fact the first example was built by Alan Stevenson of the Stevenson Lighthouse Engineers on the Isle of Inchkeith in 1804, of which there is a picture, but it doesn't really matter. And in fact, that's it. And then Alan Stevenson, um, um, so I don't mean 1804, 1830, I'm so sorry, 1834, Alan Stevenson installed, if you go back to that lens again, in 1834, Alan Stevenson installed that lens on the Isle of May Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And then the first one in England was Start Point, and Alan Stevenson designed it. 
And that, and it was identical to the Fresnel lens that design, you know, that had been developed by Fresnel. It's quite interesting because in fact, if you go back again to the lens, I mean, the glass technology was miles behind Fresnel's concept. And so that in fact, in order to catch the rays of light um, coming from out of, you know, in order to capture the rays of light and push them back through the lens, mm -hmm. he used all this sort of metal work, which is why it looks a bit odd, which still, but still it was 14,000 candles worth. But that's what Faraday would have been testing in 1836, because that's what went into start point. And Julia, where is the start point? Oh, in Devon. It's beautiful. Well, it all lighthouses, all lighthouses are beautiful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think beautiful. you're actually giving me a theme for my next uh, yeah. holiday. Next time I, uh, yeah. I do a holiday around the um, British seaside, like uh, a greatest uh, British lighthouses tour because yeah it's beautiful. except that you know everybody looks at the lighthouses which are beautiful and very few people ever look at the reason they were built which is the lights that went into them which is of course what Frank and I are far more interested in yeah. I mean they are beautiful yes of course they're beautiful and the civil engineering is very interesting and all of that kind of thing, but very few people look at the lighting. And in our view, I hope I'm speaking for us both, Frank. I mean, it's the lighting. There is no point in having a lighthouse unless you look at what goes in it. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a there's, there's a there's a quite there's a large literature on the architecture, the civil engineering of lighthouses, and even larger literature on lighthouse keepers, uh, partly driven by the sort of interest in genealogy. Um, but I mean, uh, Judy is just uncovering huge quantities of really interesting material on sort of the lighting systems, the optical systems. Uh, and um, by the time she has finished, she will sort of completely demolish all the myths that are sort of lurking <laughs> around about the development of uh, lighthouse technology and engineering. And before, so, before we move to uh, talking about other engineers involved, uh, other big names uh, besides Michael Faraday are. Uh, they also have this photo of the old class. Well, that, that that I wanted to put on because, in fact, the Stevensons, that is Alan Stevenson and Thomas Stevenson, so so the next generation after Robert, hmm. they and Leonor Fresnel, who was Augustin's brother, what they wanted was an all glass optic, because those metal fans that you see in the very early um, Fresnel lens, mm -hmm. okay, they worked, but metal absorbs a lot of light. And so that the hunt was on from the 1830s onwards to try and make an all glass optic. Both, there are all glass revolving optics and also all glass fixed optics, but this is an all glass revolving optic developed by Thomas Stevenson with James Timmins Chance of Chance Brothers, the glass makers. And I really wanted to put it on because, of course, one of the things about the optics is they are absolutely beautiful, they wonderful are. bits of sculpture. And you have a single light source within that cage of glass. The earlier reflector system I was talking about, you could have had 18 reflectors on a, on a tier and, on, you know, but of course, each of those 18 reflectors had its own oil lamp, whereas this is a single light source within a cage of glass. And they are absolutely beautiful. And they did completely transform lighthouse illumination. It took a while for the British to take them up, because, in fact, the Stevensons in particular were so good at the reflector, at the parabolic reflector engineering is that in fact it was a question of you know the best being the enemy of the good if you like because of course they were terribly expensive and so for a long time reflector technology went on in this country in France they declared in 1825 that all lighthouse lighting was going to be Fresnel lenses but then you know that was France whereas we puttered on with the reflector technology but we, you know, they did all wind up. This is a quite an early one, and the system, the the optics got more and more and more um, elaborate. 
And they got more and more and more virtuosic with actually, they could split the beam, they could send it off in several directions. Thomas Stevenson and Chance in particular, became, I mean, they became virtuosos of prism design, if you like. That's how I always think about it. Uh, Julia, uh, this might sound like a very silly comment, but with all that glass on the design of it, it looks, it also looks like, which is not, but it does look like a luxury item piece of decoration. Well, I mean, luxury if you think they're expensive, I suppose, but they, <laughs> they, they, they transformed object. everything. Yeah. Um, and of course, the I couldn't, I mean, the, they were, you had to be a really brilliant mathematician to in fact design the form of all those lenses. Fresnel was a brilliant mathematician. Thomas mm. Stevenson was a brilliant mathematician. James Timmins Chance, I think the seventh wrangler at Cambridge was a brilliant mathematician. That's the bit I can't put because it's so abstract mathematically, but they were brilliant mathematicians in order to produce these absolutely beautiful things. I mean, if, the if other, I other... wanted to see, sorry, if I wanted to see this live in which museum what, what is this one kept for example or where can one visit uh some lamps there's, a, there's a very very good lighthouse museum at fraserburgh in the north of scotland um and there's a lot of good stuff but it's usually it's not really on display in the national museum of scotland they had a wonderful wonderful gallery of display until about 1992 when inexplicably they dismantled the whole thing and it's now all in store fraserburgh is very good and then I mean, the really wonderful museum, except it's the most terrible hassle to get to, is at Wesson, which is an hour and a half by boat off the west coast of Brittany, which is where you can see all the early Fresnel stuff. That's where I took the photograph of the Argand lamp. Mm. But it's a hassle. It's wonderful once you get there. Fraserburgh is, is the easy option in Britain. I mean, Frank, there's, couple, right? I mean that, there's one point that should be mentioned about it's not a, they're not only sort of beautiful objects, they're also incredibly heavy objects. And, <laughs> and so the way that they were made to rotate was by putting them, floating them in a bath of mercury. Um, and that is now a days a sort of no-no because some <laughs> health and safety people don't it has like to be cleaned. Like if you go, go back to, if you go back to the menorah point light that we showed at the beginning. Uh, yes. Uh... If you go back to that, you will see that yeah. thing with square holes in it is the mercury float. Ah, or actually, yeah. the, no, no, the thing, the, it's not the thing, I'm looking at it improperly, that you see the man's head. Where yes. the man's head yes. is, is the mercury float. And in fact, it, the mercury float was invented again in France, which, you know, they had brilliant lighthouse engineers in France, was invented by a French, was the head of the French lighthouse surface called Léon Bourdel. And they had by that time figured out that your flash didn't have to last four seconds, which is what they used to think, because, you know, your retina will take in a flash and your brain will absorb it. And they realised that you, in fact, could have smaller lights rotating at much higher speeds. And the secret of that was the mercury float because, of course, there's no friction and you can just push it around with a finger and you can speed it up and slow it down. Because, in fact, one of the things you did, um, as you know, you, one of the reasons you could distinguish one light from the next was the speed of rotation. So you suddenly get much higher speeds of rotation, which adds to your um, vocabulary, if you like, of, of um, which lighthouse is which. Fascinating. And I think it's time that we look at other names, other engineers involved. Uh, we've talked uh, quite a lot about Michael Faraday, but uh, you, I know you wanted to talk about Jonas Smeaton, for example. Well, only because John Smeaton built the Edderstone Lighthouse and is not only considered to be the father of civil engineering in this country, but the Edderstone Lighthouse. Um, which is, I think, the fourth on the spot and survived till 1882. So Smeaton is the father, if you like, of lighthouses. Uh -huh. So who's the next, who's next on our list? Well, Robert Stevenson 
is in fact the father of Alan and Thomas and was the chief engineer for the, for the Northern Lighthouse Board for decades. And all his sons went into it. I mean, Thomas and Alan with some reluctance because they would, one of them wanted to, I mean, they didn't want to go into the business. And Thomas, I think, wanted to go into the church or perhaps that was Alan. I've, anyway, they did not want to go into the lighthouse build in the lighthouse business, and I always feel that Thomas Stevenson produced the most famous, one of the most famous novelists ever, called Robert Louis Stevenson, who of course was intended for the lighthouse um, business. Oh. And I always think that actually Robert Louis Stevenson is sort of Thomas Stevenson's teenage rebellion against his tyrannical <laughs> father. But there you go. That's how I. <laughs> Robert, Robert Lewis, I love that. I love that story. <laughs> Robert Lewis Stevenson's writings, you can see that he has, in fact, spent a lot of time building on some hideous island way out, you know, building lighthouses. Julia, am I right <laughs> thinking that Treasure Island is based on one of the islands his father took him to when building a lighthouse? Yes. I, it all, the, I mean, you read them and all the sort of nautical stuff and it, it all comes from that. He had a very difficult apprenticeship before he managed to turn into a novelist. So, yes, if you read, if you read, if you read them, if you read something like Treasure Island, you read it with Robert Louis Stevenson's, um, you know, lighthouse builder antecedents on your shoulders. At least I do. Um, and actually, if we could, can we come, if we could come back to chance, because Faraday comes in here again. Uh, it, we, it's we, we, um, if you go to if you look at Chance, uh, who's the so next one? Right. I think James. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So James Chance is the manufacturer. Brilliant, and he sets up the lighthouse department at Chance Brothers, and. The 1861 Parliamentary Commission that Frank was talking about earlier, in which, in which the Board of Trade is doing its utmost to take over the lighthouse service. And one of the big, big problems with the English lighthouse service, though not the Scottish, the Scottish, you have to remember, had the Stevensons, they had in-house permanently employed lighthouse engineers, which Trinity House didn't. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit, you know, it had out external consultants like James Walker. But when it came to look at the English lights in 1861, yes, they were building Fresnel lenses all over the place by this point. But they didn't understand about the setting and about the height and about, you know, how you, far you could sit. They didn't understand the sort of basics about how you positioned the actual optic. And James Chance said to the commissioners that, of course, although he was given the job of designing the glass elements, he wasn't given the job of designing the metal pieces in which they sit, or indeed the entire optic. And in fact, George Airy, who is the Astronomer Royal, says about the English optics, it really gave me a feeling of melancholy to see the results of such exquisite workmanship entirely annihilated by subsequent faults in the mounting and adjustment. And James Chance and Faraday get together and they sort out the problem and they produce a way, Frank will know more about this than me, they produce a sort of staff in which once you've got all the components of the height, the distance you want it to be seen, you know, the angles, etc. They, in fact, can build it in Chance Brothers lighthouse workshops and then can ship it out on site. And then it works perfectly because they've done it all in advance in this in, instead of this rather piecemeal system. And Faraday is absolutely crucial in here. Absolutely. I mean, Faraday and Chance form a very good uh, working relationship, and Faraday actually stays with the Chance family uh, when he goes to Birmingham to uh, help. Um, and so, a couple, just one point about Chance. Um, uh, although Chance came from uh, a family of glass manufacturers going back into the 18th century, uh, he studied mathematics 
at Cambridge, and as Julia said, he was so Wrangler, which is pretty bloody good words to say. Um, and it gives, it gives a lie to the sort of idea of those people who support the sort of the notion of the decline of England, that the decline of England is due to sort of university educated people turning their back uh, on industry. And that's, and chance is a really good counter example amongst others uh, of that not being the case because chance mm -hmm. as Julia said took his mathematics back to the glass factory uh, and was able to design with faraday uh, this unified unified optical system and that's that's the key point every everything has to fit together in a single system you can't you can't subcontract out light to one contractor optics to another the frame to another you've got as faraday and chance showed bring them in to it has to be a joined system. up approach Absolutely joined up, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and of course, after the 1861 um, parliamentary paper, Trinity House, and if we come on to, uh, I think, the slide of Douglas, Trinity House, for the first time, employs an in-house permanent engineer on the spot, which is Sir James Nicholas Douglas. So they're very, very far behind the Northern Lighthouse Board in the way they organise, you know, who builds the light so that they're contracting it out. And then Sir James Nicholas Douglas, who is absolutely, who's brilliant and is also an inventor of lighting systems. I mean, really, and he and his famous, his most famous claim, claim to fame is actually he moved Smeaton's Edderstone Lighthouse onto the um onto Plymouth Hoe and built the new Edderstone Lighthouse about 1882, a bit further over from the original site. Mm -hmm. But he is their first salaried, permanent, paid up in-house engineer. So the 1861 Parliamentary Commission, although the Board of Trade didn't get its, didn't get its way, you know, it was a huge step forward in both the administration and also the sort of technicalities of the lights. Is that fair enough? Would yes, you say for yes. uh, Julia Frank, um, I'm just curious about whether you visited the Michael Faraday Museum at Trinity Boy Wharf because we did a talk about it here live on the Thames Festival. And I, I I was just I was just wondering if you got uh you got to see it because they recreated uh, Michael Faraday's office and uh, oh, nice. lab at the Trinity Boy Wharf. Uh, it's like a micro museum, but it's it was well it's lovely and I think kind of a still I think it's still there. Um, but yeah, we just right. talked about it at the beginning of. Well, when I went to do the YouTube video with James King, he, he didn't show me that. I should, should <laughs> when I, when I, let's go. I shall go and have a look. One thing we have, one thing we haven't talked about, are the sort of colonial lighthouses, which, where the Board of Trade um, did take a very strong lead. Hmm. And uh, though, I, as I said at the beginning, so the colonial lighthouses um, disappeared um, as the empire disappeared. Uh, Faraday did play a sort of role. So, for example, he helped design the Red Sea Lighthouse, and that remained under the Board of Trade control until the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, when Ted Heath's government suddenly said, why are we running a lighthouse at the entrance of the Red Sea? And it was handed over. I'm not quite sure who it was handed over to. It was handed over to someone. Uh, but uh, and Trinity House took over the Gibraltar Europa Point Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. So the Board of Trade's role in lighthouses, despite their ambitions in the 1850s didn't succeed and Trinity House inherited the residue. Uh, I think just the, um, I think just Gibraltar Point, uh, mm -hmm. Europe Point in, in Gibraltar. So there's a sort of little RNA lurking there in sort of the Board of Trade's um, imperialist ambitions. Is this um, the Trinity House building? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course, and, it was bombed in the war, and then it was quite, and has been re, has been completely rebuilt. And this is uh, this is behind the Tower of London, you said. Yes. Uh, in front, in front, in front, in front of the Tower of London. Sorry, yes. Yeah. How, how how important has been Trinity House through centuries 
saving lives at sea. Well, I mean, hugely important, along with the Northern Lighthouse Board, the Irish Lighthouse Board, the American Lighthouse Board. But Trinity House is, is the earliest of them, even though it didn't get going on building lighthouses till 1609. And it certainly dominated the practice here in the, 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 you know, in the English lighthouses. And it, interestingly, D. Allen Stevenson, who wrote the really a very good lighthouse book in 1957 was the last direct descendant of the Stevensons in still in the lighthouse business mm -hmm. is unbelievably sort of mean minded about Trinity House and says there, you know, they don't spend enough money oh, and etc. Where certainly the work I'm doing, I mean, Trinity House are right in there spending money, looking for, you know, new lighting systems, looking to improve lighting systems. And they were fantastically successful at it. So I always slightly feel that I'm in mean, the Northern Lighthouse Board. Naturally, they they they're interested in the Stevensons, but actually, Trinity House, I mean Trinity House made a colossal um, contribution to lighting across the world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, lighthouse technology nowadays is a, is a curious thing because everybody can own a sort of satellite navigation system so in some respects it's a sort of redundant technology and trinity house has closed one or two lighthouses um over the last few decades but i think it's still something comforting especially for um sailors in small boats to see that sort of flash coming around so they know where they where they are um mm. and while one while one obviously can't say there aren't any maritime accidents uh, certainly the lighthouses have reduced enormously. There's still accidents that happen. If you sort of look at the um, uh, Royal Navy running aground in the Isles of Scilly in the, sometime in the 18th century, um, that simply wouldn't happen uh, at, once you have an effective lighthouse. Because even, even if you don't know precisely where you are with an early lighthouse system, at least you know you're in you're in a dangerous vicinity that you see a lighthouse because the light yes. lighthouses were built where there was shoals or reefs or shallow water or, or whatever. They're a really effective technology. Um, whether it's still absolutely necessary, mm -hmm. they still keep going. I mean, the other thing to, the other thing is to say uh, there's a technological imperative uh, that Trinity House had from a really quite early stage in the 18th century uh, is still with it. And now all lighthouses are automatic. Um, there's, there's no staffed lighthouse anywhere in the country. And I remember many, many years ago going into the headquarters of the Northern Lighthouse Board in George Square in Edinburgh. Um, and I was taken into this control room, uh, which, had, which had five computers in it. And the uh, guy said, from these five computers, I run the entire Scottish lighthouse system. And if mm -hmm. they do, a, they do a, a report every 15 minutes. And if the report flags up, something's changed in that 15 minutes, then he would scramble a helicopter to go and find out um, what, the, what the problem was. And he said, I have replaced 600 men. I must have made some sort of face at that comment. And he said, don't be sad. I was born on a lighthouse. It's a miserable life. Yeah, no, I mean, it, as, as you said earlier on, it had the highest instance of drunkenness and suicide of any profession in the country in the 19th century. Mm. Not fun. Well, no. it, unless you happen to like a solitary life looking at seabirds and learning French. I mean, I don't know, I'm being frivolous here, but, you know, <laughs> it took a special... It wasn't entirely solitary. I mean, you're, you're, it's, it wasn't it's entirely solitary. solitary. You're four or five people and you... Yeah, well, but, but, yes. but, yeah, but they are... But I think, because we, we had our previous event was uh, talking to former lighthouse keepers who had trained at Trinity Boy Wharf, and they loved it. Uh, they, they really loved it, and they, they told really beautiful stories of where they had been and the, the work that they mm. had done, which they were very passionate about the job. But it is very isolating because um, mm. they said, which I hadn't thought of until we had this event with them um, last time out, um, that even if it's three of them, because they are doing a shift, one is doing the shift, the other one is resting, the other one is sleeping. So they, they, it's not like they were like 
sitting having a cup of tea together at any point during the 28 or four weeks period that they were doing um so yeah it is it is uh, very isolating you you need to have a passion for the job and a passion for for being there and i guess have a, a, a uh, yeah, a certain personality that will help you survive the the isolation. Yeah, but also, I mean, you know, there are the land lights. It's the real isolation are the are the you know are the rock are the rock lights out at sea, because certainly in the old days you'd be out there three months and you know and hope that the supply boat would come out. So it was the it was the, it was the rock lighthouses way out that I think were. I think you either loved them or else you were sort of desperate and you only got home every three months. It, it, who knows? I mean, who knows? I, I, one thing I, I, I really shocked me, well, I've learned a lot uh, during this conversation, so I'm, I'm really, really grateful I had the opportunity to host this. Uh, one thing that really shocked me, Julia, is the the low figures, the, the number of lighthouses that we had before Trinity House started building some more in the 17th century for uh, co considering the British Isles, Ireland, England, Scotland, we are surrounded by water and uh, it was, the number was really low when you, when you mentioned that before, like how many, how many little, uh, they didn't have a lot of lighthouses and how many well, lives were lost at sea as a consequence. Well, you you know there weren't there wasn't such an enormous amount of shipping there. In mind. I mean, they picked up as shipping picked up a really you know, and as, and as the North America trade opened up, you know, shipping you know increased exponentially from you know the middle of the eighteenth century onwards. And before that, you know, you were sort of trading locally and. You know, it wasn't such a big deal. It was really, you know, the whole rise of 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 industry and, you know, Britain as a great industrial nation, and that 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 began the proliferation of lighthouses. And the French would, you know, the French also would were doing it. It was the increase of of global shipping, wouldn't you say, Frank? Yes, yeah, yeah. More shipping, more accidents, more lighthouses. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So you know, it's. And it's sort of teeny weeny up till you know the first thirty years of the of the nineteenth century, and I mean, also yeah. I mean Scotland, which realised after it built its first four lighthouses back in seventeen eighty six eighty seven, they realised they needed some more. They were only they were only given permission to build four, so they went for Act of Parliament and they built two or three more. Mm -hmm. And then there was a sort of hiatus from 1890, from 1794 to um, 1804, in which they didn't build any lighthouses at all, because not only were you building the lighthouse, you had to build a station, you had to build the roads to these places way out on the coast, you had to build cottages and, you know, storehouses, as well as the lighthouse, they were terribly expensive. So, in fact, Robert Stevenson points this out. So it's all a bit kind of driven by economics. It's driven by the increase of global trade. And it kind of trots along behind. And then you get this kind of explosion after Trinity House takes over all the private lighthouses from 1834. I've got a final question uh, uh, for both of you. I don't know if perhaps Frank uh, will want to elaborate more. And... Um, it's a silly question, really, but um, if you think of Edison, it's sort of like a household famous name. Like, even if you don't have a background in science and technology, uh, Edison is a name well known by an average person out in the street. Uh, whereas with Michael Faraday, you, you, you're very familiar with the concept of um, I couldn't explain it, but I I have heard the concept electromagnetism, but I have I have I have to admit I had never heard I did I was not familiar with Michael Faraday name I was familiar with the concept he developed or invented but no 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 with the name so why is Michael Faraday as a person as a I I, I wouldn't say an idol but Edison is very famous but Michael Faraday people who are in science know about him but he's not a household name 
Well, but did you know about Smeaton? You take the Eddystone. Did you know about Smeaton? So you're, na- you're giving the name of a lighthouse and the name of an engineer. Those are two sort of contradictory things. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I mean, Faraday was a household name in the 1930s. Uh, the centenary of his discovery of electromagnetic induction had huge celebrations in 1931. Um, the Albert Hall was hired for an exhibition uh, on Faraday. There was a grand commemorative meeting at the Queen's Hall addressed by the Prime Minister. There was a dinner at the Dorchester Hotel and so on and so forth. Uh, so he was a really well-known figure in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, indeed, so well-known that when a certain Margaret Roberts was studying chemistry in Oxford in the 1940s, uh, she adopted Faraday as a hero, uh, which she announced um, loud, and, loud and clearly uh, when she became Prime Minister as Margaret Thatcher in 1979. She and, um, would make speeches saying that sort of Faraday's, the results of Faraday's discovery are sort of greater than the uh, uh, capitalization of the stock market and, and so on and so forth. And I'm pretty sure that it was her who ensured that Faraday appeared on the £20 note uh, in the 1990s. Uh, but people's, and even today actually, um, if you if you do every opinion poll I've seen um, done by new scientist or something like that, saying name a scientist, Faraday is normally there. Normally, about sort of hovers about six or seven. Though he did mm-hmm. get to number one on one one of one of those polls. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure why, but there we are. Um, so I'm not. I don't. I think he's still a reasonably well known name, but certainly not as famous as he was in the, in the 1930s. But that was entirely driven by the need to associate the new modern technology of electrification with a well-known scientific figure, and Faraday fitted that bill. In France, there was Ampère. Uh, um, uh, Ampère uh, had equally grand celebrations in 1936 to mark the centenary of his death. So these things are driven by need i mean it's a bit like sort of quick and watson's 50th anniversary actually i, I saw there's a sort of quick and watson's 70th anniversary party uh for their dna happening in philadelphia this this week um so it's it, it it's send it's sending messages to the public which is why you celebrate things and why we are doing this tonight indeed yeah. <laughs> uh, Julia, Frank, I don't know if you want to add any final uh, thoughts before we uh, draw this to a close. Well, no, thank, thank you for being such a Thanks. good questioner. Yes, oh, indeed. Yeah. Thanks to you. Uh, I, I, I have certainly learned a lot this evening. I'm absolutely delighted and I'm very grateful I had the opportunity of doing this. And Julia, Frank, thank you very much to both of you. I, all the time we have people watching live. Thank you very much for being with us. And if you liked this video, please comment, like and share so more people get to know uh, everything that Michael Faraday did. Uh, Julia, Frank, thank you very much and have a lovely Pleasure. evening. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Thank you. Good night.